such a welcome, such a welcome for a Brit. Uh, um, I'd like to apologize for my country. Nobody in crowdfunding voted for Brexit. Which one? F-U-C-K out of the room. <laughs> and also thank you for speaking in German. I must remember to talk slowly. Um, I am technically now Irish. As of last week, I have my Irish passport, which means I can come back. Uh, but it also means I talk very quickly, and that's not helpful when English is the first language probably of 5% of you. Michael has encouraged us to tell stories uh, and I wanted to share the journey in the UK over the last four years. Um, but for me, it started 20 years ago when I was sitting in a hangar in British Airways, setting up BritishAirways.com. And Web 1.0 was really my first experience of how technology can rebalance power between the individuals and the institutions. And it was very effective in British Airways because um, it basically removed something called differential pricing. We used to charge a different amount of money depending on where you bought the ticket. Um, and it was called uh, the mug factor in British Airways. We made 300 million pounds a year of profit because people didn't know it was more expensive to buy it in Germany than it was in the UK. And suddenly with the internet, with all the prices in the same place at the same time, that transparency gave more power to the consumer and less power to the institution. And that's when my light bulb moment happened, when I realized the potential of technology to change that balance of power. Now that was where 1.0, and a lot of industries were disintermediated in that way. Web 2.0 is different for me because the consumers can connect to each other. So it's not just the power of the individual versus the institution, but it's the buying power of the crowd. And that's the much more significant change from that perspective. In fact, that word consumer, I think, becomes redundant very quickly if you're really a forward-thinking company where, as we've seen today, your customers may be solving your problems and designing your products and funding your business. So a seismic change, I think, is coming in the relationship between those who design and make the products and those who just buy what they're told to buy because the advert says that's what they're supposed to do. But finance in some ways, is the last walled garden. Protected uh, somewhat because of uh, the sheer scale of the incumbents. You know, in the UK, we have five banks that are too big to fail and too big to jail. The regulation is also a barrier to entry. And so it's not surprising, perhaps, that it's taken so long for finance to feel the change in crowd buying power, but also why it will change so dramatically and so quickly when it does move. So there are some major drivers of change in the UK, hopefully in Europe, in different degrees, in different places. And I've tried to create a framework for the sequence in which they happened and why I think that crowd finance is now a permanent and significant part of how money works in the future and not just a gimmick that's going to go away. So can we put up the, are they showing? Can you see any triangles? Oh, click, oh yeah. Yes? I really think crowd finance was born of our banking crisis in 2008. Um, if it wasn't for the case that there'd been such um, a loss of trust in financial services from the crowd, the general public, if it wasn't that the banks had stopped lending, there wouldn't be people and projects who needed money. And that created the opportunity in the first place. And still, the biggest factor 
limiting growth for us is not the demand of the investors or the lenders, it's the demand of the projects. So if you're somebody who wants to raise money through crowdfunding, you have the bargaining power more than anyone else. That's good. Cool. And because of that financial crisis, and this issue of five banks, too big to fail, too big to jail, the support of the government and the policymakers has been huge. We always want competition, but this is not just competition to get a better deal for investors and for businesses. It's competition to diversify financial services so that it becomes more stable and so we can avoid 2008 happening again. And this is manifest in lots of ways in the government's openness to changing regulation and changing tax. And we really, really in the UK do not like our banks. We really don't like them. And yet, until very recently, we didn't move our money. And if you take three basic rules of change, there has to be significant dissatisfaction with the status quo, the way things are today. There has to be a real alternative, real, that is much better. And the question is, how much pain is there moving from one to the other? So we see um, a demand for money. We see a government supporting new entrants in the market. And we see people with money who want to move. But that is all irrelevant unless you have the regulation. Now, the Crowdfunding Association was set up in 2012 and we work together to have a single demand for appropriate and proportionate regulation. Because without it, nobody took us seriously. The newspapers still had pictures of people burning their 50 pound notes because that's what peer-to-peer -peer lending is. That's what crowdfunding is. You're just gambling and losing your money. Our goal was to keep the crowd in crowdfunding. The objective is to democratize finance and to have wealth not be treated as a skill set. Just because you're rich doesn't mean you're clever. Just because you're poor doesn't mean you're thick. The very idea just gives me hairs on the back of my neck. And we were successful in creating a new category of investor, um, a restricted investor, so anyone can put up to 10% of their money into these investment and lending opportunities. Today, is the day that the regulations are under review. So our deadline for communicating to the regulators' feedback is at six o'clock tonight. So apologies for leaving dinner early and, and being late in today, but I've got a huge thing to draft. And at the same time as the regulator is saying what it thinks of the industry, I am writing a letter to say what the industry thinks of the regulator which we'll probably put in the press. So that's how I'm spending my afternoon on the journey home. But it's the, it really was the inflection point. Demand for money, support for competition, people looking for places to put their money. And, you know, in many cases, you know, for, for average ordinary investors, money is the means and not the end. You need money to do something with it. And sometimes... You don't need money at all in the sharing economy with Airbnb and Love Home Swap and Just Park and everything else. Money is just there to help us do things in life. It's not what we live for. And I think if you work in finance and financial technology, sometimes you forget how everyday people um, organize things. And particularly in the UK, we have a large number of people now who don't have financial advice. And this is the market I'm talking about. 5.5 million people who have money but not advice. One trillion pounds in the UK in banks earning less than the rate of inflation with interest rates so low. And the interest rates being this low for such a long period of time also helps remove the apathy and get people to want to um, move their money. But the absolute star of the show is our new ISA. So ISA stands for an individual savings account. Half of the population of the UK have them. I'm sure there are similar mechanisms in different countries. It's the government trying to encourage you to put some money aside for rainy days and for later in life. And the fact that there's a new innovative finance ISA doesn't just mean that your loan and debt-based crowdfunding is tax-free. If you make money, you don't pay tax on it. But it's a massive signal that this is not alternative finance. This is now mainstream. 
This is for everyday investors. 5.5 billion pounds so far raised in the UK. Last year alone, in one year, 20,000 businesses raised 2 billion. This is now becoming much more proven and core. And whereas we used to eat the crumbs the banks didn't want, we're now beginning to nibble at their breakfast. And finally, I mentioned pension freedoms simply because when people are deciding for themselves what to do with their money, I think they like real things. I think they like businesses they understand and people they believe in and shops around the corner and bricks and mortar and solar panels. I don't think they like derivatives and contracts for difference and options and puts and calls and convertibles and things that I frankly don't understand. The opportunity here to close the circle is to say that with pension money, let me put it down, you have patient capital or healthy capital where people are choosing where to put their money. They don't want to move it every five minutes. It's not what their life is about. They don't get paid every time they switch and churn and move their money. They want to leave it there doing a good job. And if it's earning them a return, that's good enough for them. And if you're the business, it's a world of difference being owned by the crowd, being owned by your customers, people who love what you do and buy your product, than being owned by a venture capitalist or being on the market with an appetite for quarterly returns and constant growth and no appetite for the investment into what makes it more of a sustainable business. So we're talking about a small number of people, a large number of people with a small amount of money each, and it's a market that traditionally nobody has wanted to address, but it is a huge addressable market. And it's not just about the money. My first venture into crowdfunding was Trillion Fund, um, a platform that aimed to get as many people as possible to put their money into renewable energy, not to raise as much money as possible. And we talked about triple bottom line returns, and we talked about people aligning their money with their purpose in life. And it was a huge journey, um, we were very successful in changing the regulation, working together as a unit and getting the ISA created. But we were trying to do all three things at the same time. Build a crowd, build a platform, and find really good places to put your money. And I pitched that 53 times to venture. And I can pitch. 53 pitches. And the response was the same. This is fantastic. It's a really exciting market. We totally love it. We think you can either do the crowd or you can do the platform or you can do the deal flow. We don't think you can do all three things at the same time. So the D-Day for Trillion came when the UK government pulled its support for renewable energy. Some of you in the room I can see might have seen me cry on stage um, because that was just not a good day. And as a single vertical crowdfunding business, we were exposed to that kind of change as some of the projects just stopped and others regrouped for nine months. But really, we kind of knew beforehand that what we were doing was too ambitious. So um, my learning is we, I have recently moved into dining, which is an existing fund, which has 35,000 investors, and which is a team of 18 people doing deal flow, and that now wants to do crowdfunding. And the opportunity for those kind of partnerships is you've, you've, you've descaled, you've shrunk the size of the challenge because you've already got the investors and you've already got the deal flow, you just need to crowdfund, but you've scaled up the size of the opportunity. Um, it took me a long time to let go of my, this is my baby, this is my business, this is four years, I put a lot of money and a lot of time into this. But oh my God, is it much easier when you're doing that with other people. And I think that's my key learning um, across the board. It's just that those partnerships between innovators and the in incumbents really are what makes the whole market sustainable and worthwhile. And this is a firm that, until I arrived in February, had a £25,000 minimum investment. And that £25,000 minimum investment is now £100. And it will always be £100 for as long as I'm in there. So the challenges for the UK now are very real. Um, you can see the intensity of the different views. People feel very strongly about in or out. It's a real challenge for the country. There's still a lot of anger there. And nobody really knows what's going to happen. So I guess my only view is that 
we know we have to have scale. If you want to be skinny, if you want to ensure you offer really good returns for the people putting their money in, and you're a competitive source of money for the businesses or projects, you have to be skinny. You cannot be greedy. You don't take a big spread in the middle. And if you want to be skinny and you want to survive, you have to have scale. So 2017 in the UK is scale up or die. It's very, very challenging thinking that we may not be able to passport into the UK, into the EU. Um, we're maybe not quite a big as country as some people like to think we are. Um, there's perhaps a period of humility ahead. Um, and I'm sure that in the end, we will find a solution and things will work out. But from my perspective, it's been very, very damaging to the confidence in the sector and the investment. And it frankly gives all of you lot an advantage over me, which doesn't make me massively happy. So I think we had a great first, first mover advantage. I think that the regulation is absolutely appropriate and proportionate. Um, I really feel that if I learned one thing in the four years at Trillion, it was I couldn't do it by myself. Um, life's got a lot easier. I'm in a different tool, but my purpose is unchanged. And when you have uh, a room of people, innovators like us, with that sense of purpose, we can be very very disruptive indeed. So look out, here we come.